Thanks, James. Thanks, Joshua. Morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we're starting a new series. You'll be glad to hear we're out of First Thessalonians and we're into this letter of James. Um, it's called Dealing with Duplicity. That's, that's the title that we've got on this morning's message, uh, Dealing with Duplicity. And I want to just say at the outset, uh, why this title? We can move on through uh, the first slide here. We're just waiting for the room to catch up with the PowerPoints, if you're watching online. Just give it a moment. Well, let's start with the first and say something about James. Just a few, like getting our, our, our um, location in the, in, the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. Who is this James? Well, James is a half-brother of the Lord. Uh, this is one of the earliest letters. Some believe it's the earliest letter in our New Testament, probably around 45 to 49 AD when James wrote this. He's um, writing to mainly Jewish believers in Jesus who have been scattered throughout the Roman Empire, possibly after the persecution and scattering that was recorded in Acts 8 and verse 1. You can read about that there. Let's move on. Let's just set in the context. What's the main theme? The main theme of the letter is all about what it is to have authentic faith in Jesus. What it is to be truly a Christian and living this thing out. Uh, it exposes to us. James takes out loads of things that are contradictory in our lives. Things that are contradictions. And he says, well, look at this. What about this? What are you going to do about this attitude? What are you going to do about the way this is working out in your life? And James is a very challenging letter. Personally, every time I read James and 1 John in particular, I get rattled to the core. The Holy Spirit really uses these letters. They're very, very, particularly, I find them anyway, challenging. James is challenging. Read 1 John too. If you want to be challenged, get 1 John out and spend an afternoon just having a cup of coffee and reading through 1 John to see what happens. But it exposes contradictions in our lives. James is basically reminding us, I, I'm suggesting to you that he's reminding us of the two great commandments. Uh, love God with all your heart, not half your heart, not three quarters of your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Wholeness, fully, committed, get on with it. Give Jesus your all. Love God with all your heart, not half-hearted. And love your neighbor. He's basically, he says, if you love God like that, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. You're going to live differently. And you can't leave out love your neighbor. James is all about love your neighbor. Leviticus uh, 19, I believe it is. There's so many parallels there. We're not going to go into it, but love your neighbor is what James is all about. So, love God, love your neighbor. James is steeped in the teaching of his half-brother Jesus. He is steeped in the Sermon on the Mount in particular. Uh, if you want to do a study on that, feel free. Read the Sermon on the Mount and then try to find out where is James getting all this stuff and see the parallels. Uh, one commentator pulled out, I think, around 32 allusions or parallels directly from James into the teaching of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, that's another thing. Let's move on this morning before we get into where the Lord wants me to preach from. Why this title, Dealing with Duplicity? Neve, uh, whenever my wife Neve here, whenever I told her that this was the title of the series, she said, what are you doing? What's that word even mean? Nobody knows. What's duplicity? Why don't you choose a word that everybody understands and stop trying to be uh, clever more? So uh, I just said, well, Christians are intelligent. Christians can understand things. And I'll explain it. So here we go. Before we spend four weeks in a series that no one knows what on earth is going on here. The title is about this. God wants to deal with our duplicity. What's that? What is duplicity? Well, we better find out. The dictionary definition from the Merriam-Webster online is the duplicity is contradictory doubleness of thought. Contradictory speech contradictory actions, being double, the quality or state of being double. That's what it means. Let's move on to the next slide. And let's say this is what the Lord wants to do over the next few weeks. Mind the gap. 
Mind the duplicity gap in your life. So the idea of doubleness is key. Uh, the Latin base of the word duplicity means double. It means twofold. And God doesn't want you double. He doesn't want you to be two people in the same body. He doesn't want you to be a Christian and an unbeliever at the same time. He doesn't want you to be a theist and an atheist. He doesn't want you to live as a Christian and live as an unbeliever. That's not what God wants. He wants you to be a Christian from start to finish. Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you get the idea with all your heart. That's what he wants. He wants you to be real. So so the idea here of duplicity carries the idea of being dishonest, deceitful, not even genuine, not open. So he's saying, mind that gap. Could it be the case, and I suggest this to you before we get in, could it be the case that you can live as a Christian a double life? Could there be two yous? in the room every week. The you that's in the room and the you that leaves the room and then lives out the rest of your life. Could there be two yous? Could there be the Christian you and the real you? If I put it like that. I mean, if you're a Christian, you're a Christian. And that's just who you are. Your identity is in Christ. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about being consistent. Being consistent. Being, being genuine and authentic. Could there be two yous going on here? Like, uh, as I was preparing this, I just thought just before I got up, um, like Superman in reverse. Two yous. I mean, uh, uh, he pretended, Clark Kent pretended uh, to be Clark Kent, but he was really Superman. So he pretended to be less than what he was. And I think we do that in reverse. I think we pretend we're Superman and women when we're really Clark Kent. We've got a double life. We, we give this image to the world. And, we, and we, when people watch us and see us, this is who we are. We're Superman. But really we're living a double life. Most of our life is Clark Kent stuff. So dealing with duplicity. Is there the person who attends church and is there the one who lives and acts and thinks and speaks the rest of the week? Is there the one that you show and portray to people on Facebook or the one who really exists? That's what it's all about. You know, Facebook is all about telling people what you want them to see and what you want them to know about you, who you would like them to think you are, when God knows who we really are anyway. Are we living like that fake book life? Well, God says, well, we need to get our hands on this. Is there a gap in our lives caused by doubleness? That's, that's the idea. And yes, here's the point. I have this gap and you have this gap and God says, mind the gap. That's what he's doing. And God says, I want to close the gap. The gap between what's seen and what's real on the inside. The gap, that's the gap that God's constantly trying to get at through teaching and preaching. That's the gap that the Holy Spirit wants to close and bridge the gap between who we portray ourselves to be as Christians and the integrity of our hearts really underneath. That's the gap caused by duplicity, being double. That's what James is all about. I'm just suggesting to you, as you read through James, James is saying, quit the double-mindedness. Quit the double lives. Quit saying you believe this and then doing that. Stop it. No one can serve two masters, says Jesus in Matthew 6. You can't serve both God and money. You're going to hate one and love the other. Jesus is just saying, make a decision who your God is and go after him with all your heart. We must be wholehearted, all in, sold out for Jesus. So I might put it like this before we go through our first our first message, our first uh, chapter, that God, through James, over the next few weeks, here's what he wants to do. God wants to locate and eliminate contradictions in your life. It's not going to be, it's not going to be comfortable at times. It's not going to be nice. And James talks about how the Word of God acts like a mirror. And when you look in the mirror, sometimes it's not nice. Sometimes the mirror shows you, I've got to do something about this. I've got to do something with my hair. I've got to clean the dirt of my face. Sometimes looking in a mirror, and God's word is a mirror, sometimes it might not be a nice experience. So, but God wants to locate and eliminate contradictions. God wants to root out attitudes and actions that are incompatible with authentic faith in Jesus. Attitudes that don't match the attitudes of a Christian. God wants to challenge us to be real not double, servants, not consumers. Because our Savior was a servant who washed people's feet. That's who you say, I'm his disciple. It's him, the servant one. The one who was worthy of it all and yet grabbed the basin and washed people's feet. Not a consumer, a servant. James says, faith without works is dead. 
God wants to challenge us to be real. God wants, and finally, God wants to challenge us to begin to put our money where our mouth is in terms of Christianity. You say you believe it, let's see it. Let's see it. Let's, let's let the rubber hit the road and let's get on with this. When it comes to discipleship, let's see it. When it comes to Jesus being my Lord, let's see it. Saving faith is an act of faith, and James will tell us that later on. So James aims to cure you, yours and my spiritual schizophrenia. We're spiritual schizophreniacs at times where we are double in all what we do. And James says, come on guys, not anymore. Now let's get into our text. Let's open please James chapter 1. And God's going to help us this morning with our hearts. Because trials is the, the, the emphasis of James chapter 1. Various trials. Trials hurt. And everyone experiences trials. And sometimes the cry of our heart is just, help. Help, it hurts. God, are you there? God, help me. This is hurting. I'm going through difficulties and trials. I'm surrounded by so many various different issues. And I don't know what to do. Help. Sometimes that's a great prayer to pray. Just help, it hurts. And be real with God. And sometimes you don't think you're going to make it and you feel enough's enough, Lord. I've had enough, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm giving up on this. And your problems and your pains are so hurtful and so many that you don't see a way through. You've got money worries. You've got health worries, health scares. You've got fears over your children's life and what's going to happen to them in the future. You've got breakdown of relationships. You've got marriage problems. You've got work issues, work pressure. You've got anxiety about Work commitments, you've got disappointments that you're dealing with and failures and rejection. You've got losses, you've got bereavements and grief. You've got loneliness, anxiety, depression and sickness. And you might be asking today, help Lord, it hurts, it really hurts. You may ask, is there any way through, is there any help for the various trials and hurts in my life? Does, does this word of God do anything and say anything to me? Or is it just fluffy stuff from the by and by? Well, no, the Bible is anchored. It's real, it's true, and it's not fluffy. It's actually practical, and it's, God's going to help you this morning. That's why I want to give you five principles from James chapter 1 this morning. Just five things that I see as I make my way through the chapter that will equip you to handle hurt. Handle your trials better. That's what it's all about. Just five bits of truth that I believe James has thrown out here this morning. And the Holy Spirit's going to take it and use it if you're open. If you're not open, you'll leave the same way you came in. Like every week, we have to receive this word, which is able to transform us and save our souls. So God never promises us a path out or around trials. God does promise us his presence and his help through trials. That's, that's the biblical way of looking at it. God doesn't promise you every time trouble comes, I'm going to put my hand in and immediately before it gets too much, I'm just going to pull you right out of it. Now God says, when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you will go through it, but I'll be with you. I'll be with you and I'll strengthen you with my love and my grace and my power and I will never leave you or forsake you. But he doesn't promise us an easy way out. He promises us an assisted way through. Now we've got to get that right in our heads. God's not going to pull us out of everything. Sometimes he will intervene. Sometimes we pray and God will part the Red Sea and do things that are miraculous. And sometimes I want to raise our faith level and say, pray for that. Pray for that. Pray that God will step in and stop it. Yes, pray that God will miraculously intervene and do a thing. But more often than not, if there's trials in our lives, God walks us through them. He can take us out if he wants. But the pattern generally is, he promises us, I'll never abandon you in them. I'll take you right through and right out the other side. So here's five things that I just want to point out this morning. Point one, if you look at, uh, let's read verses two to four together. Count it all joy, my brothers, it says James in, in chapter 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, pure joy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It will help you if you can see divine purpose in your trial, in your hurt, 
in your difficulty. It will help you so much if you just see that God is at work in my trials. God is at work in my hurts. God is active. God isn't absent. God is active. Let me say that again. God's not absent. God's active in your hurts. Doesn't always feel like it, but the Bible says that's true. So that's where, that's where I land on it. I land on believing the Bible, not believing my heart, not believing my emotions or my feelings on any given day. I land every time. What does the Bible say? The Bible says he's with me, he's at work, and he's active. As Romans 8.28 says, it says this, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So God's at work in all things, and he's working it together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So the Bible says God's at work in all things, the good and the bad and the ugly. God's at work for those who love him. He's working it together. It doesn't say here uh, all things are good. It says all things can be worked together for good. It doesn't say pretend things that are evil are good. It doesn't say that. So in your pains and in your difficulties and in your trials, know this, God is at work. Pain is not pointless. Okay, pain isn't pointless, but pain is productive, and that's what God's wanting to get at. Pain does things in you. God's at work in you. It's like Joseph said to his brothers. He says, "You intended me harm to his brothers who sold him into slavery, treated him like dirt." But even through that, even through that situation, Joseph says to his brothers, "You meant evil, but God intended it all for good." So when you're mistreated and when hurt comes. Just know that there's two things going on. There's the way it seems, and then there's the spiritual truth underneath that God's there, and God is intending to work things together for your good. All things work together for good for those who love God. This verse here, look at verse uh, 4 again, or verse 2. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It doesn't say trials are joyful, Christian. Just smile and be happy. Just pretend. Let's pretend that evil things and harmful things, the, the pains in your life, let's just pretend that they're, they're joyful. Let's just pretend that you should be happy when these things happen. Act joyful, feel joyful when trials happen. No, that's not what this verse is saying. The joy is not in the trial itself. So it's not, it's not like God's telling you to do the impossible, the sin, you know, when, when the tears come, pretend you're happy. God's not stupid. That's not what the Bible teaches. Count it all joy. Uh, James isn't trying to much, he's not trying to change your emotions in the trials. He's trying to change what you think about it. The word there is consider it. He doesn't say feel it. He says think about it like this. Consider it like this. Think about trials this way. This is going to help you this morning. Here's how you think Christianly about difficulties and pains and trials. Here's how you do it. God's at work. God is making me stronger. God is making me more mature. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Why, James? For you know, you know, not you feel. You know it. You've you've learned something. You know that the testing of your faith produces a character. God's at work. God's making me stronger. God's making me more mature. God's making me like his son through this. He's making me like Jesus. God is molding and shaping and, and stretching me into the place where I look more like Jesus at the end of all this stuff. That's part of it. That's part of what it is to understand and to consider it pure joy. Why is it joyful? Because God hasn't abandoned you. And God's using it all to make you more like Jesus. Now, if you don't think looking like Jesus is worth the effort, I don't think the Bible has much to say to us. We just need to have our hearts catch up with what God's doing. God is conforming you and me to the image of his son. That's what he's doing. That's his aim in your life. When your faith is battered and tested and stretched, God's at work. When you sometimes feel so alone and so in the dark and so abandoned and so lost, if you're a Christian, God is at work. Okay? When times come that you feel you want to give up, that's the moment when God's most at work. Because you're going to keep going. Because you're the real deal. And God does his best work in difficult times of failure. And in your wilderness. And in your weakness. And in your loneliness. And in your emptiness. And in and all the places that are dark. God's at work. That's his best work is done in those times. Ask Joseph. Ask Moses. Ask David. Ask Job. 
Ask Paul. Ask Peter. Ask any man or woman of God who's done anything for God, who's walked with God for their entire life, and they'll say, it was in the dark days that God was most active and I didn't know it. It was in the darkness when God done his best work in me and I didn't know it. And I was about to give up. But then I considered it like this. I changed not my emotions, I changed my way of viewing it. 2 Kings 6, I just want to read to you a few verses. Go to 2 Kings, this came to me and I believe God wants it. Uh, just the principle here just to be throughout. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 15. We're not going to go into any of the detail around it. There should be enough information in the verses just to get the gist. They're surrounded. God's men are surrounded by the enemy. Okay, verse 15, there's chariots everywhere. It looks like on the face of it, it's all done. It's all over. Uh, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. We're surrounded. The enemy has us surrounded. We're done for. It's over. It just looks terrible. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? The implication is he thinks we're done for. Verse 16. And he said, well, here's what you do. Don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Let's, let's make this New Testament language. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's more with us than there is with them. And then Elisha prayed, verse 17. And he said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So the thing is this. When you're surrounded by trials and when your life just looks like there's no way out. Everywhere I look, God, I'm surrounded. What am I going to do? The first thing is don't fear. The second thing is pray that God will give you spiritual wisdom. The young man needed to see that even when it looks bad, God is at work. You can't see it. You might not feel it. The young man needed to see God's activity. He was in fear. He just seen problems. He didn't see God. He just seen the, the earthly chariots. He didn't see the heavenly chariots. And you need eyes to see spiritual truths like James is saying here. Count it all joy, my brothers. You need eyes to see this. You need a heart to receive it. So do I. Because God's at work. He's, the joy isn't in the test in and of itself. Here's the thing. The joy is in the knowing what the testing is producing. The joy isn't in the trial itself. But the joy is in the knowing what the testing is producing in you. Just like the young man they did sight. I pray that we'll get wisdom and sight today. And that's moving on now into verse 5. Let's read it together. The second point is this. It will help you if you know in trials and times of hurt to guard your faith with both hands and to seek God's wisdom with all your might and full faith. This is going to help you through your hurts. Verse 5. Now, having said all that, says James, if any of you lacks wisdom, you know, if you don't think like this, if, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not seeing it like I'm t teaching it, you need wisdom. If you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. It will. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Now, do you see the sea? You see out in the deep sea, this isn't so much talking about waves coming in and hitting the shore. It's like, it's like the swell of the sea out far deep. And it's just like that all the time. It's just moving. It's never level. It's just all the time Never right, never level, never steady, unstable. The sea's unstable. And he says, you know, if you come to God, not asking, believe in God and trust in God and loving God, if you're not asking in faith, well, you're not going to get anything. Because you're like, verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man. There's our duplicity coming in. This is the text this morning. He's a double-minded man. He's double, unstable in all his ways. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't believe God's going to help. He doesn't start to go to God then for help. He just goes on his own wisdom. He lacks wisdom, but he goes on his own steam. We can be double-minded doubters in times of trials and hurt. And James says you need wisdom. When trials hit our lives, we can, through the hurt, begin to doubt God's character. 
begin to doubt God's power. We can, in the times of hurt, we can say, even God can't help me. Keep it. I'm not praying. I'm in a mess. How am I going to be helped? God's against me. Is God even good? Does he even care? Why is he playing with me like a cat with a mouse? He could just take me out of it, couldn't he? What's he doing? Why is he allowing it? And we can get like angry and we can get resentful and we can begin to distance ourselves from God and to try to go it alone in our own strength. You know, I'll work it out. I'll work it out. This is real life, Mark. This is real life. I'm not, you know, spending time praying, seeking wisdom, seeking God. I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it quick. God says, that's not wise. Don't doubt God and your hurts. Don't doubt him. Don't doubt his character. And don't go it alone. Don't cut God out. It says, go to God. Ask God. He's got wisdom. He's got the help that you need in trials. And when you hurt, the person you need to go to most and quickly is God himself. He's the one you need. In these verses, God assures you, Christian, today. And this is a promise of God. He's saying, I'm the one you need. Okay? I have what you need. And if you're willing to ask, I'll give it. But you need to come. And you need to trust me. And stop going your own way. In times of trial, don't run to your friends of the world. Don't run to the media. Don't run to the quotes on Facebook. Don't listen to the stuff and the nonsense around you. Listen to me. Come to me. I've got the wisdom that you need to make it through. Run to the Lord to help you. The thing we need in times of trial... This text says to me, isn't maybe the thing that I would have wrote here if I was writing this uh, bit of the letter. If I was writing it, I'd go, you know in times of trial, you know what you really need? You need a miracle. In times of trial, you really need strength. In times of trial, you need this and that and the other. And some of those things are good. You need strength. You might ask for peace. You might even ask, release me, Lord, from it. And that's good. And those are biblical things to ask for. But James advises that you run to God and primarily ask for wisdom. I wouldn't have wrote that. Uh, Probably in a million years, I would never have wrote wisdom as as a primary thing. Strength, release, a touch, power, come on. No, he just says ask for wisdom, that you might endure it, that you might see it God's way, that you might have spiritual eyes like that guy who needed to see the chariots. You need wisdom to see what's happening, to submit to God. You need the wisdom to not blame God. You need the wisdom to value what God's doing in your character, that Christ-likeness is a valuable thing. I tell you what, you need wisdom for that. You know, when things are hurting, that I'm becoming more like Jesus isn't top of my agenda sometimes. It's not, but it needs to be. We need wisdom to endure and to wait So he promises to provide, and here he says, I will give it. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, and I will give generously to all without reproach. I'm not going to say to you, are you so stupid you need to come again and ask for more? What are you doing back here again? Just keep coming to me, and I'll keep giving you the wisdom to make it through. I'm not going to reproach you. I'm not going to to tell you off. I'm going to receive you and give you what you need, says God, because you need wisdom when it hurts. You need God's help. You need God's wisdom. Lord, help me to know what to do next. Lord, show me your way through. Lord, open my eyes to see what you want me to see. And give me the wisdom not to doubt you. Pray like that in times of hurt. Give yourself to God and ask for wisdom. The third thing is this. Verse 9. Let's make our way through. We're getting our way down to... Uh, halfway through the chapter today we won't make it through it all but it will help you number three in times of hurt (laughs) if you remember that trials in your life are not forever trials are temporary okay let's read verses 9 to 11 here and see what James is saying he says let the lowly brother like the poor lowly brother who is poor hasn't got maybe much materially let him boast in his exaltation you're a Christian this, isn't, this world isn't the end. There's a glorious future ahead. And let the rich man, because not only is poverty a trial, riches are a trial. You know, when you've no money in your pocket, you're, there's all sorts of temptations to come your way. When your wallet is full and your bank is full, how are you going to handle a trial like that? How are you going to handle God's blessing? That's a trial. What do you do with your money is a trial. How you handle your wealth is a trial. And he says, you better think of it like this, that 
that this isn't forever. Your riches aren't forever and you're not forever. The rich, you better boast in your humili- humiliation. Because like the flower of the grass, you're going to pass away. And the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Partly what these verses do, I think, I'm not, I'm not 100% uh, committed into this, but I think it's doing this. I think that James is reminding everyone uh, that trials to some extent, we're all on trial. Every part of your life's a trial. That we're equal in that sense, and that no trial is forever. And there's some part of the gospel that applies to your trial. The poor and lonely in this life experience trials even over a lifetime of struggle and poverty, but they can rejoice that their identity is a child of God on their way to glory. Our brothers in India and China who are poor and persecuted, well, they they are lowly at the moment, but they can boast in their trial because they're going to be glorified one day. They're going to, they're God is going to be faithful to them and bring them right through. And then the rich are on trial, uh, not to depend on money, depend on God. Steward your money well, handle your blessings well, because it's not forever either. And your identity isn't in the rich man, your identity is in Christ. And you handle it in a Christian way. And they need to be reminded that there's eternal rewards up ahead. The rich need to be reminded of the unfading treasure that Jesus gives. Don't live for this world, live for the treasure of heaven. But we're all on trial. You see? And this leads on to the big picture point in verse 12. Let's get on to the fourth point. This is another aspect of it. He says this in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man. This one verse. Commit this verse to memory. Um, I've committed this verse to memory. And this verse has anchored me and helped me in many ways. When you want to give up, you go, but there's a crown of life up ahead. You want to give up, but that's not the path of the blessed man, because the blessed man doesn't give up. The blessed man keeps going. He perseveres under trial. He's steadfast. And when he stood the test, the blessed man receives a crown of life, which God gives him. It's not, you didn't earn it by your perseverance, but God gives it to you as grace. But it's a crown of life we're waiting for you. And he's promised it to those who love him. Commit that verse to your memory. It'll keep you in the hard times. There are eternal rewards up ahead. When it hurts, remember eternity. When it hurts and you want to say, stuff God, stuff the the Bible, stuff that church, stuff the Christians. Whenever you want to think like that, you want to remember verse 12. You want to say, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Not the man who gives up. Not the woman who says, stuff the church. The woman who says, I'm in, I'm walking with Jesus. For when you've stood the test, guess what you're getting? You're getting an eternal reward from Jesus. The crown of life awaits those who walk with Jesus all the way through. And he's promised it to those who love him. And when you say, stuff God, stuff the Bible, stuff this, that's not loving God. And there ain't no crown of life at the end of an attitude like that. Trials and hurts want to stop you in your tracks and turn you back and stop your progress, but we must keep your eyes on the end and keep your eyes on the Lord and keep your heart on the Lord because the promise is to those who love him. That's what you want to do. There's eternal rewards up ahead. Open Revelation. We're going to look at a few verses. Open Revelation. Jesus uses this technique of telling you, get your eyes on the end. Don't give up. Don't flake out. And don't give up. Jesus uses this tactic. He says in Revelation 2, he's talking to seven different churches. And I'm just going to read the tail end of each one. <clears throat> and he says in chapter 2 of Revelation in verse 7, listen to how Jesus encourages us. He says, you know, there's a crown of life up ahead. But then he says, and James says there's a crown of life up ahead. But then Jesus puts in some other rewards. He says, he who has an ear to hear, let him say what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. You keep going, you're going to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Look at verse 11. He says this, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Okay? Look at verse 17. 
He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. New identity. New heaven, new new earth, new you. Look at verse uh, 26. He says this. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with an iron, with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is Jesus encouraging the church. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. To the one who conquers will be clothed, thus in white garments. And I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In verse 21, let's let Jesus finish off his exhortation and a reminder that there's eternal rewards up ahead. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. She who has an ear, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Christ powerfully uses eternal encouragement and rewards repeatedly. That's what James is doing. That's what James is doing here. He said, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial to the one who conquers. And giving up and turning back because it hurts is in conquering. Like Peter said, Jesus said to Peter one time, there were people leaving him. They couldn't take his hard teaching. They couldn't take his hard lessons. They couldn't understand them. And then they were, they were leaving him. And then Jesus says to Peter, are you going to depart from me too? And Peter just looked at Jesus and said, well, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So, what other path is there for me to go? There's a, there's a crown of life awaiting me if I follow you. If I go my own way, what, what's at the end of that? <coughs> Christian, get it clear that up ahead, there's eternal rewards. Eternal life is yours in Christ. In Christ. I want to say about loving God because I think it's important before we finish and it's this you know how you make it through your trial look at the last words in that verse verse 12 God has promised the crown of life who to it's to those who love him do you know your way through this life is to make it your goal to love Jesus and if you make it your goal to love Jesus you're making it through everything else You're making it through. If you focus on loving God, if you focus on loving Jesus with your whole heart, you'll make it through. If you don't, you won't. You've got to focus on loving the Lord. Loving God is the way through. The blessed man, Jesus himself, loved the Father and he made it through all his trials. And he he died and then he rose again to life, receiving the crown of life, if you want to put it like that, in his resurrection. He was the blessed man who did it all. He endured steadfast to the end and he was raised from the dead and he's the first fruits of those who follow him, who try to emulate the blessed man who made it through all his trials. And because Jesus loved you, he went through the trial of Calvary because he loved you and he loved his father and he was steadfast and endured everything for you and he gave up, he never gave up and he never turned back on you because he loved you and Jesus endured various trials for you. Jesus endured the trials of rejection beating, mocking, the scourging at the pillar, Jesus endured the trial in the garden, mental anguish to the point of sweat and blood. But he endured for you. He endured the trial on the cross, the wrath of God that you deserved falling on him because he loved you. And he won the crown of life, but he's willing to give it to you if you'll just emulate his life and persevere in love and God. 
And the final, the final verses today is verse 13. Let's read them together. And the final principle is this. It will help in your hearts if you get to know God better. If you stop messing around with the Bible and start to really give yourself to understanding who Jesus is, understanding how he loves you, and to just give your time repeatedly over the next year, over the next two years, and make it your aim to love him and to know him, know him better. Because the devil makes good work when you don't have a clue about the character of God. It will help if you get to know God better and what he is truly like instead of blaming God for everything. It will also help if we take responsibility for our own actions and our own decisions. Stop blaming the devil. Stop blaming God. Start looking within and saying, it's me. Fundamentally, I'm a sinner. Not God making me sin. Not Satan twisting my arm and compelling me to be the way I am. Me. And sometimes the hurts won't be helped until you look at yourself and say, my problem my doing I need to look within and let God heal me help me strengthen me give me the wisdom to make it through these hurts some of the hurts are self-inflicted not God inflicted or Satan inflicted and it'll help us to see that let's read verse 13 let no one say so he's moving from trials that are like circumstantial on the outside to the temptations and trials that come from within the, the, the evil desires and the trials of temptation. And he says, let no one say when he is tempted in that way, in that internal way, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted. When? When the devil gets them? No. Nah. When God trips them up? No. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Your problem. The problems within. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. This is what God's like. God's not like that. God's like this. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. Temptation isn't from above in that sense. Good gifts, God's blessing on your life is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God is stable. God isn't duplicitous. God is the way God is all the way through. He's holy and he's love and he doesn't change. And he says this in verse 18. Don't you remember of his own will? It was his idea. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The gospel of grace and love and mercy was God's idea. That's the kind of God you're dealing with. Never blame God. Stop blaming God. Stop looking for the, the, the reason why. It's within us a lot of the time, says James. The problem is within our God is the, the gracious creator. Our God is the God of the gospel who saved us even though we didn't deserve it. Our God is not out to get us and to trip us up and to tempt us to sin. It's not the way he operates. It's not God. <coughs> The temptation when trials come and when hurt comes is to blame God and even reject God. What's God doing? You need to ask yourself, what am I doing? What's happening within me? What does God need to change within me? Our God is gracious. He's the author of our salvation. He doesn't tempt you to sin. He doesn't want you to sin. He isn't out to harm you, but he's out to bless you. God is holy. He's consistently holy. God is love. He's consistently love. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. There's no shadows due to change. He doesn't vary. He's not up this day for you and down the next day against you. God is stable. We're not stable. We're duplicitous. We blame God. We look for the way out. And sometimes some of our hurts won't be helped until we allow God to pinpoint the issue within us and then we say to God, God, it's me is the problem. I'm the sinner. I'm saved, but I'm broken. I'm not looking to blame you. I'm not looking to blame the devil. I'm saying it's me a lot of the time. Now the devil's there and the world is there, but he couldn't get at us if there wasn't something within us to respond to it. We're sinners by nature. And we need to have that nature redeemed by the Holy Spirit and helped. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, it's not everything that needs to be said on hurts, but it's some things. Lord, if we've been blaming you and looking to blame uh, this, that and the other, the world, it's everybody else's fault. It's not my fault. It's, 
It's, it's me. It's, it's us, Lord. We're, we're to blame primarily. Help us to take responsibility, Lord, for our hurts, for our decisions, for our actions, Lord. As far as it lies in us, Lord, help us to be true and honest with you. Help us, Lord, never to blame you and to, to say that you're wrong or you're to blame, Lord. You're never to blame. You're good. You're the author of the gospel. You give us what we don't deserve. You love us. And Lord, help us, Lord, to think about trials like this. Think about what you're doing in the pain, what you're doing in the heart, how you're at work, how you haven't abandoned us. And like that guy on the mountainside, when he got into fear and he said, I'm on my own, we're surrounded. Lord, give us spiritual eyes to see what's happening, that you haven't abandoned us, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And Lord, help us to come to you in faith, in prayer, for wisdom. Lord, we repent today of being double-minded, maybe about you, maybe about um, the way forward. Lord, double-minded in who you are, double-minded in prayer. Is it, does it even work? Lord, in these trials and in these hearts, Lord, help us to be fully focused and committed to you. And Lord, help us to love you because that's what's going to bring us through. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has withstood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Lord, today make our hearts grow in our love for you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you saved us and it's free. In Jesus' name, amen.